All right, Dr. Lapula, thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us here at the Natural History Society of Maryland this evening, talking about farmer ants and mealy bugs and their, their and honeydew, which is which is not a melon. Not a honeydew melon, not in this case, no. Yeah. Well, thanks for for having me. Um, I'm excited to get to talk to all of you about one of the topics I've been working on for quite a long time. Um, I was just thinking, um, before I get started with the presentation, we were thinking about um, spring, the beginning of spring. And for me as a, an ant nerd, um, one of the things that is um, a harbinger of spring for me is the, when the first ants fly, the first species of ant to fly in Maryland and basically anywhere in the, the east, um, eastern US will be Prinolepis in Paris, which is sometimes called the winter honeypot ant. And they were flying probably about two weeks ago. So they're, they usually come out, they're, they're the first ants where the, the queens and males will fly on their mating flights, um, first ones to pop up in the springtime. So I always feel like spring's coming when they're, when they're out. Um, and it's interesting to sort of see when they first come out last year because it was so mild. I think they came out like almost the beginning of February, which was incredibly early for them. This year it's John, more on target. John, where would we see those if we're, if we're trying um, to you would basically see them uh, more or less anywhere, for, even in your backyard. They're a really common um, ant, um, and um, they have a really cool natural history. They they form these incredibly deep nests. They go down um, up to upwards of twenty feet down into the ground, and um, they only the workers that you see on the surface typically only come out when it's cool. So by midsummer, they kind of disappear and they come back out again in the fall when it's cooler. Uh, but yeah, in your back, in my backyard, I live in Timonium, and they were all swarming around my um, uh, maple tree. So I always take my um, in the spring. I teach ecology and evolution, and I always take my class out to. There's a whole group of trees up here on campus that always have thousands of um, ants out. Usually this time of year for a few days, when on a on a good warm sunny day is when they sort of pop out. And you know, most people are just completely oblivious. And then once you realize, once once you point it out. Some of them are really freaked out because they realize there's all these ants flying around their head. But then um, what's amazing is you can see the little males flying around and then there'll be this big queen that will come zipping by and all these males will be following or there'll be this like, little comet of tail of males following her. So anyway, I encourage all of you to take a look out. Um, there'll be some more ants coming out a little later in the spring as we warm up. But the first one is um, the winter honeypot ant as it's, as it's called. Um, but anyway, thank you all so much for coming out today to hear let um, me talk about uh, talk about ants and dive into that a little bit. And I guess what I'll do here is share my screen. Let me let me sort of do this here. Here we go. And this is a big long mouthful of a title. So let, let let's just break it down. And just saying ants and mealybugs is probably um, good enough. But this is actually part of a um, this group of ants that I work on, which are called Acropyga, it's a genus of um, largely pantropical ants. I'll talk more about them uh, in a moment. And these specialized mealybugs that they use um, basically as cattle. So we'll sort of talk about that. This is a project I've worked on for a long time. I started working on these ants back in 1998 when I started my PhD um, work and I did my dissertation on this um, group and have um, worked on them sort of ever since. So it's been a it's been a, um, a long journey with between me and these ants. I have an affinity for them. They've gotten let me travel all over the world and studying them in different places. So it's been great. This is part of a collaborative project too. A lot of the results from this, um, this project Symbax, um, which is just a abbreviation for the symbiosis between Acropyga ants and Xenococcine mealybugs, um, is actually a collaboration between me, um, uh, two collaborators at the Natural History Museum uh, at Smithsonian. Um, and another faculty member here at Towson. So we're sort of um, have currently have a National Science Foundation grant where we're um, working on this uh, project. So let me see here, there we go. So I'd like to start off by sort of putting these ants sort of in a bigger context. And the bigger context is this idea of mutualism. And mutualisms of course, is sort of in the simplified sense, or right when you have two or more um, groups, species um, occurring in a relationship where they're mutually benefiting one another, or at least 
for some of that time mutually benefiting one another. Um, and um, mutualisms abound in the world. There are mutualistic relationships all over the place. And when you stop and think about it in the context of evolutionary theory, mutualisms are really weird because in many ways they seem very counter to the ideas of um, what we would expect in sort of when we sort of think about how natural selection works and how um, fitness pressures and those kinds of things work. And in fact, even going way back, um, even people like Charles Darwin really struggled with this idea of explaining how mutualistic relationships could evolve and not just how they could evolve, how they could thrive and be maintained over long periods of evolutionary time. So I just threw some pictures up here of just looking at different mutualisms, right? We can think about mutualisms being from um, corals and fish, um, uh, lichens, of course, are mutualistic um, organisms between a fungi and an alga, sometimes a bacteria, depending on the species. We have um, sloths, which are actually poster children. I mean, besides being incredibly cute for animals, um, poster children for mutualisms because they have algae that lives on their fur and all these different groups of insects that feed on the algae and the poo of the sloths, everything. So lots and lots of things. And of course, in the insect world, one of the most well-known um, examples of mutualisms is that between flowering plants and various insect pollinators, right? Where we have these very elaborate relationships that have evolved with uh, many different groups of um, insects and flowering plant species. And if we sort of step back and sort of think about ants for a moment in this context, um, we can sort of put them in this mutualistic context as well. Now, of course, ants are really, are, are, are particularly interesting among insects, right? Because they're eusocial. So what does that mean? It means that they live in societies, if you will, where there's um, an egg laying queen or in some species, many queens, depends on the species. And that queen lays eggs, most of which will become workers that sort of conduct the work of the colony, right? What that means is that ants have an outsized role in the communities that they live. So even though an individual ant is pretty small, and, and, and not particularly significant. When we sort of think about at the colony level, they can have these huge impacts, right? And so we myrmecologists used, like to always boast about, you know, ants being the sort of dominant insect group in most terrestrial ecosystems and those kinds of things. And, and they are arguably um, in many contexts sort of the dominant group when we sort of think about um, in terms of how they impact the communities with they, in which they're found. And that has everything to do with their sociality. And what's interesting about that sociality, um, many species have evolved um, groups of mutualistic relationships with other organisms. Um, what I'm showing here, um, example of um, different groups of um, ants that have entered into mutualistic relationships with plants. And they're quite um, elaborate mutualistic relationships that have evolved with plants. If you sort of look up here on the um, slide on the um, upper left, we see that sort of expanded um, part of the plant stem and there's a little queen ant in there. You can see a little eggs um, sitting around. Um, plants have evolved, um, some plants have evolved specialized structures that are hollow twigs and stems that actually are where the ants can nest. And what the plant gets for that is the, the ants protect them. If, if any of you have ever traveled to the tropics and leaned against the wrong tree that's protected by ants, you know it pretty quickly that it's being protected by ants. And so um, um, this bottom picture here, this little thorn, this is a pseudomyrmix ants, which are particularly fierce. These, these hurt when you lean up against something that they occur. These are the well-known acacia ants um, and they live inside these thorns and they protect their plants um, fiercely. Um, uh, and over here on the uh, right-hand side, this um, uh, picture here is a, a specialized um, structure on the plant where plants actually will produce um, uh, rewards for the insects, so nutritive rewards. They'll have um, proteinaceous or sugary substances that they'll secrete out of specialized glands to actually attract ants to them, to help them help the ants um, persist on them. So there have been these elaborate um, plant-ant relationships, mutualistic relationships that have evolved over um, uh, many millions of years. And one of the groups of relationships that I'm gonna sort of focus in on is this idea of what we might term ant agriculture. And so um, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of this, but we can sort of break ant agriculture up into sort of two broad categories, if you will. We can have what we, what we can term the farmers and we can have what we call the herders. And we're gonna focus on the herders today, but let me talk a little bit about the, 
um, the farmers first, because you're probably most familiar with um, farming ants in terms of um, ant agriculture. The most famous example of um, ant farmers are the fungus growing ants. And um, the sort of most famous of those famous group of farming ants are the leaf cutters, which many of you have probably seen at zoos or um, various natural history museums where they'll have um, uh, fungus growing ant, um, leaf cutting ant uh, exhibits of live um, ants. And what these ants do is really fascinating where um, fungus growing ants in general, what they do is they gather groups of plant material, they bring it back to their nest. In the case of leaf cutters, they actually cut fresh leaves, um, but they bring back uh, leaf material into their nest. And in that nest, they actually inoculate that material. It may be plant material. Some, some of them gather dead insects too and, and um, scat of animals and things like that. It depends on the species. But what they're all doing is they're actually farming fungus in their nest. And what they're doing is inoculating that, um, those plants or whatever it is with um, fungal hyphae and growing um, a fungus garden inside that nest. And they tend to this garden, they tend to the garden, they weed it, they keep it so that it's only fungus um, in that garden. And what they do with that um, garden is their larvae, uh, their baby ants feed on it. So they actually feed on the fungus and eat the um, fungus. And it sort of is the main food source for these groups of um, ants that we can, um, that we see here. There are many species of, of fungus growing ants. In fact, there's a species that occurs up here um, in this part of the world. Um, there's there's a tra a Trachymorum excepta trinalis is a fungus growing ant. It's kind of obscure, um, but um, in, it typically occurs in more sandy habitats uh, where you'll find it um, around here. But this is a big group and this is a particularly well-studied group. And what's interesting about this um, group is that the fungus and ants are interdependent upon one another. So the, the fungus growing ants um, have to have a fungus garden to survive. It is their way of surviving. And in um, most cases, that's true with the fungus too, that they have to live, it has to live with the ants. So we see there's a very tightly linked obligate mutualistic relationship that's evolved between these, um, these different groups of fungus growing ants and their fungus gardens. And this is a really complex story. I'm not even gonna get into it because it turns out there's bacteria that grow on the ants that produce antibiotics that actually stop some of the fungal pathogens that try to kill the fungus gardens. It's a very complex um, story um, that we can, um, that we see here. What I'm gonna focus on today though is probably the less well studied part of ant agriculture which is the herding ants. Now, many of you, you know, I, I'm assuming most of us on this, I was gonna say in this room, but I guess on these tubes, intertubes, whatever we are, right, um, are um, nature nuts. And many of you have probably seen herding ants, but you may not have paid particularly attention to it. Um, around here, it's quite common. Um, if you go to like a rose bush or, 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 or many flowering plants and you see these little gray um, insects, little aphids that are feeding on the um, plants, oftentimes those will be tended to by ants. And so what the ants are doing is they'll run up and down along those aphids. And what they're doing is um, um, collecting honeydew. Again, not the melon. What they're doing is um, plant sucking insects like aphids and um, mealybugs. Um, what they um, do is they're feeding on phloem tissue of the plant. And one of the results of that is that phloem um, has nutri nutrients in it, but it's also really watery. So in order for the insect not to completely throw its um, physiology out of whack, it needs to get rid of some of that excess water. And the way it does it is they have a specialized pore on their backside, um, lovingly called the anal pore. And through that, um, they e um, emit this excess water. And that's what we're referring to as the honeydew because their digestion is not perfect. Um, the honeydew will have nutrient, um, nutrients in it. And the ants come along and feed on that. So it's kind of a sugary, um, um, nutrient rich uh, substance that's produced. You may have noticed this honeydew, although you might not have known it's what happened. If you ever parked your car under a tree or something and you've come out and there's this shiny little glaze all over your windshield or your hood, that's honeydew. There were aphids or um, uh, other scale insects, maybe leaf hoppers that were up there sort of kicking out all this excess honeydew. Now, in most cases, this relationship that ants have with aphids, and, and over here on the up, upper right, this is a group of um, citronella ants, really interesting group of ants, quite a few species up here in Maryland um, that also live with um, mealybugs um, in the ground. Um, and um, in most cases, this is a facultative relationship. And what I mean by that is that 
you know, the ants will go along foraging and if they find a group of aphids or some mealybugs, they'll start tending to them, feeding on the honeydew, but they don't have to have the honeydew, they eat other things. And just so I didn't, didn't sort of mention the, the, the thing that the um, aphids or mealybugs get out of this is they get protected, at least temporarily by the ants. Um, as you can imagine, if you're a, you know, these plant sucking insects are particularly vulnerable um, because they're sort of sick, sitting still, they have this big long, stylets that stick into the phloem tissue and they can't move very fast when they're feeding. So a little parasitoid comes along or a predator like a ladybug or ladybug larvae, whatever it might be, they're pretty vulnerable. And so ants will protect them. And, and um, my son, sons and I have actually done this experiment where you can stick little um, uh, ladybug larvae on um, a, a, a branch that's being tended to by ants on aphids and the ants will go crazy, right? They'll chase the little, the little larvae right off. So they protect it. It, um, protect them as well. So there's there's this sort of relationship, and more, like I said, most of them this is facultative. So it's just temporary. It just it can happen if the ants happen to come upon it. Um, we refer to this relationship, by the way, as trophobiosis, which is just um, a way of saying that how the ants and the aphids or mealybugs are enter into this sort of relationship. There are actually interesting. I'm not going to get into this too much, but there's actually a group of lysinid butterflies, caterpillars that also actually exude a honeydew-like substance. It's actually different than what we see in aphids and mealybugs, but um, that actually get tended to by ants as well. This is particularly in Australia, there's quite a few of these um, examples. And what's really wild about this, um, in some cases, the um, lysinid butterfly larvae actually become parasitic because they get brought into the ant nest and then they eat the ant larvae um, So um, um, that we see. So most of these are facultative relationships. So we can think about these as the dairy farmers of the world. Right, so if we sort of think about, we have we have the fungus farmers, and here we have the the the, the dairy um, farmers of the world. Right, these this sort of group of trophobiotic ants, as we might call them. Well, what I'm going to talk to you about is one particular group of trophobiotic ants that is unique in many ways, and that involves this genus called Acropyga. And here, what we what this picture actually really nicely sums up this relationship. So up here is a worker. Um, Acropyga that you see here, this little yellow ant here. And what I should say about these ants is this is largely a pan-tropical group. So you're not going to find Acropyga here in Maryland. It's much too cold. They're largely, their diversity peaks in um, tropical rainforest type environments. They get into some warm temperate, more sort of subtropical places. You can, there's a species that occurs in extreme southeastern Arizona, um, but they're largely sort of rainforest species. That's where you're primarily going to find these um, find these critters. And what they do is the workers you'll never see on the surface foraging around, right? So when we think of ants, we think of all the ants scurrying around outside or in our kitchens or wherever they may be. These ants are entirely subterranean. So the workers only live in the ground. And what they do in the ground is they form these big diffuse, these sort of diffuse nests, and they make their nest, nest chambers along roots. And if you look sort of at the bottom along here, you see this root and these little light bulb looking things along the side, those are actually mealybugs. And what they do is they tend to these mealybugs inside their nest. And so they move them around and stick them on roots and they feed on the honeydew that the mealybugs are producing. What's really, so there's several things that are really different about this relationship, but one of the things is that these two groups are completely interdependent upon one another. So as far as we can tell, um, the ants and the mealybug species that are involved in this trophobiotic relationship are obligately um, involved. In other words, they have to be um, with each other. Now, how faithful they are to each other in terms of which species goes with which, I'll talk about a little later because that's actually an area of our research that we're really interested in. But this is an obligate trophobiotic relationship that we would talk about um, here. And what's really wild about this relationship and sort of the thing that makes it really different than even some other cases of obligate trophobiosis, because there are other groups of ants that are obligately trophobiotic. They have to live in these relationships. But Acropyga do something that no other groups of ants do. And it involves this behavior that um, I've termed um, trophophoresis. And what this is, of course, most ants, as I sort of mentioned at the very beginning, right? When we think about ants, we think about the little workers flying around. But remember, the workers are by and large sterile, right? They're sterile females and they don't lay eggs. Um, there's some weird exceptions to that. But in general, that workers don't lay eggs. And um, the way they reproduce, of course, is by producing winged queens and winged males. And the queens and males will fly off in these big mating flights. They'll mate, 
the males die. The males just all the only thing the males do is mate, and then they don't do anything else. So the males mate, and they um, they'll die. But the queens will land, take off their wings, and start a new ant colony. And that's how most ant species reproduce. Not all army ants do something really really weird and different. But most ant species reproduce in this kind of way, where they produce winged forms, at least for part of the year, they fly up, start a new colony in this way. Well, what's really fascinating to me about Acropyga queens when they do this, um, so here we have a male and a queen in love's embrace here. And what you'll see, this is the queen down here on the bottom, the males up on top, right? And insects, the females are almost always bigger than the males. Um, uh, and what you see in between her mandibles is this little white package. And what that package is, is actually a mealybug. And so what the queens do when they leave their birth nest, the unmated queens, they'll actually grab a mealybug with them. And they use that mealybug to start a new herd, if you will, of mealybugs in their new colonies. And what's fascinating about that is what that means is we have this really weird phenomenon called vertical transmission. And that's just sort of a fancy way of saying the, the ants are essentially controlling the mealybug reproduction because it's the queen's picking a mealybug, taking that mealybug that's then going to move to the next generation, the next ant colony um, that's moving from that birth nest. And because of that, um, there's um, been a lot of interest, and by a lot of interest, I mean me and the small group of researchers I work with, in looking at this relationship because um, because of this control that's a, 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 um, potentially being exerted by the ants um, in terms of what mealybug gets selected and what one gets to reproduce. So this Trophophrisi. Another really cool thing about this Trophophrisi is it's been going on for a long time. This is actually um, a fossil species called Acropyga glossaria, which I described back in my PhD work. And what we see here is this is a Dominican amber fossil. This is actually, there's actually many specimens of these in Dominican amber. Um, um, and what this is, Dominican amber is about 15 to 20 million years old. So it, it's, it's um, amber that's found in the Dominican Republic, um, to, what, what's today the Dominican Republic. And um, so this is about 15 to 20 million years old. And um, Dominican amber is really famous because there's lots of biological inclusions in it, right? Lots of insects, there are sometimes even lizards and bird feathers and flowers and leaves and those kinds of things. There's also lots and lots of ants in Dominican amber. And among those the Dominican amber, there are some pieces that um, have been discovered where there are Acropyga queens. What you see here on the left, here's a queen. You'll see there's a little mealybug caught in her mandible. Here's a male. So presumably these were in um, mating and they got caught in some sticky resin and it ended badly for them, but ended up as a boon for us because we get to see this behavior sort of captured 15 to 20 million years later of Trophophorisi occurring um, in, that, in that time. And so over here on the right, you just see a close up of, of one of the queens and here you can see that mealybug um, between her mandibles. So it's just sort of interesting. We have this fossil evidence. We know this behavior goes back at least 15 um, to 20 million years ago because here's the, the proof. I love looking in this, um, looking in these amber fossils. So as I sort of mentioned, um, this Trophophorisi is sort of, if you will, sort of the, the linchpin, because what it's doing is it's controlling, um, when we sort of think about these two partners, so we have these mealybugs and we have these ants that are sort of involved in this. And what's happening here is dispersal um, is being theoretically controlled by the ants because which mealybugs get to sort of leave the nest, if you will, is being controlled by what queen um, is selected. And um, that may mean that there can be genetic manipulation of the symbionts of the mealybugs by the ants. Now, they're not getting in the lab and genetically manipulating, right? But what we're saying is that they're selecting individuals um, based on some criteria, and we do not understand this process of selection is very poorly understood, but, um, uh, but you can imagine over many generations that this happening, that the ants, if they're selecting certain individuals based on certain criteria, can change those populations of mealybugs over long periods of time. And as I sort of mentioned, we know this behavior goes back at least 15 to 20 million years. So Acropyga and this group of mealybugs have been involved in this relationship for a long time. Now, this is really analogous to what we see in fungus growing ants, because one of the things that um, we see in fungus growing ants is, um, as I mentioned, you know, fungus growing ants need their fungus in order to survive, right? Well, wouldn't you know it, when a queen fungus growing ant leaves on her mating flight, 
she actually sticks some fungus, the fungus growing ants actually have a specialized pouch in their mouth where she actually sticks a little bit of a fungus garden. And that fungus, that little bit of fungus garden is then used to start her new garden when she establishes a new colony. And so um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because this is an analogous situation between what's happening with these acropyga ants and their mealybugs. And what we know in the fungus growing ants is there's all these fascinating evolutionary things that have sort of emerged as a result of this manipulation that the ants are doing of the fungus um, by carrying it. And um, there's every reason to believe that within the acropyga system, we would see sort of, again, analogous sort of situations that's occurring. Okay, so I'm not gonna get too far into this. This is sort of um, um, a bunch of different hypotheses that we have. But one of the things, one of the, the big question we're interested in right now is this idea is that if you look at the, the phylogeny or the, the, the evolutionary tree of the ants, and if you look at the evolutionary tree of this group of mealybugs called the xenococcines, which is the clade, not exclusively that lives with acropyga, I'll talk about that in a moment, but that, that lives with that, um, they all seem to be obligately um, dependent on acropyga ants. Um, one of the questions we ask is how have they affected each other's evolutionary history? So if you sort of imagine, like, you know, we all think about the tree of life, right, sort of over time. And the question is, if you have this vertical transmission being controlled by the ants and the potential manip reproductive manipulation that might be occurring as a result of that, we might imagine that the phylogenies of these two, the evolutionary trees of these two groups in some way is related to each other. In other words, we might say these different hypotheses are basically saying um, different versions of that. So the first hypothesis is saying maybe there's just a random association and there's no influence that they're having on each other's um, evolutionary history. But the other two hypotheses are basically saying different versions of co-diversification, which is basically saying if you have an acropyga species and over evolutionary time, it speciates into two species, do the mealybugs that it was using also speciate with it in such a way that we get this pattern of one-to-one -one species to species co-diversification? We know that that's actually not going to be true. It's not going to be that strict. In fact, we know um, for a number of reasons, um, know that's almost certainly not going to be that clean cut. But we also know from other groups of organisms that's seldomly that clear cut. But there are various versions of what we might call diffused co-diversification that could be occurring. Um, and so we're testing these hypotheses right now. And I'll also talk about that in a moment. Um, this is just showing us a picture of these. Uh, just a little bit more about these acropyga ants. So as I mentioned, these are um, pantropical. The workers are entirely subterranean. Um, they, they take on this very pale yellow color that you see here. This is actually one of the, the brighter yellow ones. This is Acropyga acuta ventris, which is a Southeast Asian species. Um, and um, their, their cuticles, their, the body coverings are very, very thin. Um, they um, are prone to sort of drying out. They live in the ground, right? So these are species that are living in the ground, in the leaf litter, in rotten logs. They have very small to, this species actually has a rather large eye for this group. Most species don't really have any eyes. There, there's just like a few little facets that are remaining within them. They're typically covered in hairs, um, which are probably related to sensory reception inside the dark tunnels of their caves um, and things like that. Um, and so these are the ants here. And one of the things I just want to sort of mention is the different mealybugs that they use. So it actually turns out that there's, um, Primarily, most of the relationships involve this group of ants called the Xenococcidae, which are where these Xenococcines um, uh, come from. Um, and they belong to in these three genera here. Um, and the other family is this Rhizicidae, which is another group of mealybugs. These two families of mealybugs are both each other's closest relative. And um, all Xenococcids are live with Acropyga. So all of them are only ever found in Acropyga nest. Within these Rhizicids, some of these species in these genera are found with acropyga, but most are free living. That's really, really cool because what it actually tells us is we actually have evolution's done the experiment that evolutionary biologists want to do, which is that we have one group that's entirely with this group of ants, where we might expect to see the tighter co diversification going on. And then it seems this other family, there are independent movements of some of the species to living with acropyga. And so it's essentially evolution doing the, the same experiment multiple times. 
And that is a really awesome opportunity. The fungus growing ant people don't have that opportunity because all their fungus only live with the ants. But in this case, we actually have these um, independent events that have occurred. In fact, these independent events that have occurred are, there's really one really weird case, this species that I described a number of years ago called Acropyg orthesia, Williamsi, which is a species that occurs in Australia. And I won't get too much into this um, example, but the reason this is such a cool species is this is an entirely different group of scales separated by millions and millions of years from the mealybugs that typically live with Acropyga. And these have completely independently moved on to living with Acropyga in Australia. And what's really wild is one of the things I'm doing on my sabbatical is I'm working out of the um, USDA down in Beltsville, which has the national scale insect collection. And um, we've actually discovered another species of this Acropyga orthesia in the collection. Um, and so this is an entirely separate evolutionary event. So what's really interesting in the system is we have multiple origins of trophobiosis, of these trophobiotic relationships, um, and different groups of mealybugs and uh, other groups of scale insects. This is actually belongs to a group of scale insects um, that typically are up on the surface of plants, not in the ground. So this is a really weird, um, a really weird one um, that we see here. So one of the things I just wanna say is that one of the things that um, I really emphasize to all of my students is the, the importance of field work. And I just sort of throw this out here because um, one of the things that my research is fundamentally dependent on is going out and making these kind of discoveries that this lives with the ants and that we can make those associations because one of the hardest things is that the soil turns out it's full of mealybugs. Most of those mealybugs don't live with Acropyga. So you have to actually, when you collect them, you have to make sure those associations are really real um, that you're seeing and field work is really the way um, um, to do that. Um, so we spend, my lab spends a lot of time in the field. In fact, right before the pandemic happened, actually as the pandemic was happening last year, we were actually in South Africa collecting Acropyga and mealybugs. It was made an exciting journey back. I think we were on the third flight back from Johannesburg to Atlanta. Um, okay. so. One of the things that we see with these Acropyga and the scale insects that they um, use is that the scale and the, the mealybugs have all of these interesting adaptations and they're not random adaptations. They seem to be adaptations that are, that are, um, that have evolved for living with Acropyga and in particular living with Acropyga in such a way to provide them with lots of honeydew that they live. So, so here we have, this is a uh, Eumermacacus sarnati, which is a um, species um, um, from Fiji. And um, this species here um, sort of sort of nicely demonstrates what these mealybugs look like. I think they're really cute, wild looking. Mealybugs are really wild looking insects. I mean, even as an entomologist, I look at mealybugs and I'm blown away with how bizarre they are as insects go. But I just threw some um, adaptations here. So one of the things is that they, they don't, the ones that live with Acropyga don't produce wax or at least, well, the Xenococcids, none of them produce wax. That's significant because wax production. So one of the things, if you're a mealybug or an aphid, you're, you're spew, spewing out all this honeydew. Um, you don't want that stuff to stick on your body because it's bad news. Fungus is going to grow on it. You're going to attract predators. You're going to attract um, um, parasitoids. All those things you do not want to attract. And so most scale insects, and the reason why they're called mealybugs, right? You may have noticed this on your house plants, right? When you get mealybugs and if you touch them, you often get sticky and you get kind of waxy. Um, they make wax, they produce wax that coats their body. Um, and the reason they do that is that way the honeydew, when it falls off, comes out of their pore, it rolls off of their body and doesn't stick to them. Well, in the ones that live with Acropyga, they don't make wax, which uh, is consistent between many trophobiotic mealybugs that live with ants. They stop producing wax. In fact, they don't even have the pores anymore um, to produce wax. They've lost them completely. Um, they have this um, very large anal ring, which is the structure that's used for secreting honeydew. They have this little basket of hairs that actually holds the little droplet of honeydew in, um, um, in, um, in, um, in there for the ants. In fact, this, what I call this curiously um, curled tail, this long shape that you see of the mealybug, what they do is they hold that tail up over towards their head. And when an ant comes and attenuates them, sort of taps on them, it actually lowers that tail and that little basket has a little droplet of honeydew that the ant then um, picks up. So there are all these interesting adaptations that occurred. In fact, one of the things I'm doing on my sabbatical this semester is with the um, scale insect collection is actually looking, um, I'm counting hairs and looking at pores and things like that to look at different um, things that have um, co-evolved 
or potential adaptations that the mealybugs have for living with these ants um, that we see here. So here's just a nice little picture. Here's a little mealybug being um, held by an ant. One of the neat things, I'm just gonna show you some data and uh, I won't spend a whole lot of time on it, but one of the things I've been really interested in looking at these adaptations, one of the things that is true about Acropyga is they have these really highly variable mandibles. And I've been interested for a long time if that variation that we see in the mandib mandibular shape, the shape of the parts that are holding the mealybug. So here we have this little white mealybug. You can see it being gripped by the ant here. Um, I've been really curious to see does the mandible shape in any way relate to the shape of the mealybugs, which also come in this wide variety of shapes um, in, in some way as a, as a way to um, know which mealybug you're sort of picking up. Um, this is just showing you a variety of the Acropyga mealy, um, mandibles that you see here. So this is, this is just four. There, there are about 40 described species of Acropyga. There's probably double that amount undescribed. Um, so I'm just sort of showed you some of the extreme forms that we see here. So you can sort of see these are little teeth that you see on the end here. This back part, sort of the part facing towards the left is where it's inserted into the head of the mandible. And this front part here is the little teeth that they're using for manipulating. And you can see, hopefully, um, by looking at this, that there's actually a lot of variation, both the numbers of teeth, the shape of those teeth. This one on the bottom left here has this weird, fat, rectangular um, bottom tooth, really bizarre. Lots of variation in mandibles. Actually, their variation is really unusual among ants within a genus to kind of see this amount of variation. So I, I have a grad student who's just finishing up his um, thesis work right now, looking at how that mandible shape might relate to the variety of mealybug shapes. So these are mealybugs here. Now they don't look like this in real life. So when you study mealybugs, what you do is you take them, you clear them. So you clear out their um, insides, you stain them and you smash them on a slide, you squish them on a slide. So these are slide mounted mealybugs. So that's why they look pink. That's just the way the stain is um, that we see here. And you can see here, this one on the left is a big fat round individual that we see here. This one on the left is much more slender. So again, looking at this variety of shape and trying to see, do the shapes of the mealybugs correlate in any way with the shape of the mandible? So what we did is this um, fancy analysis called geomorphomorphometrics, which is basically just a way to um, try to take the shape and then analyze it in such a way to see um, what variation we see and then try to correlate that back between the mandibles and the shape of the mealybugs. So these little dots that I show you here is just that I'm showing here are just what are called landmarks. And this is what we sort of um, placed across the different specimens. And this is what we were measuring, this sort of shape very, what we would call shape variation um, that we see here. So we run that through our analysis and we get these um, these plots here. And what this is showing you is the extent of variation. So this one in the middle here, the, the black outline here is showing you the consensus shape. So that's showing you if you took all the mandibles that we measured, this is what the consensus shape looks like. And the sort of lighter white dots um, around it are showing you the, the extensive variation that's seen within all the specimens. The same is true over here for the uh, mealybug shape on the far right. Um, that you see. So you run this in a, a multi, um, um, in a, a principal components analysis um, and take a look at the, the shape. So you can put this on different plots. And what this here is showing you is that consensus shape and it's showing you different axes. So the um, uh, vertical axis here is going from short to long. And what I'm saying by short to long, it's sort of referring to the width of the mandible. And then the uh, horizontal is doing the same thing, but it's doing the long axis of the mandible. And so this I think makes a little more sense. So here you can sort of see the different variations that we see across that um, space. What we refer to, the, we refer to this as morpho space. So this is showing you the morphological space of all the variations seen within the Acropyga mandible. So quite a bit of variation um, that you see here. And then what we're doing right now, and we actually haven't entirely figured out a great way to do this just yet, we're, we're, because no one's actually done this. Um, we're, so what this is showing you is the Acropyga mandible. So the species of Acropyga. So on the right here, or on the left here, we have Acropyga arnoldi. And it utilizes, is in a symbiotic relationship with a mealybug called Eumermacacus scorpioides. And so it's showing you the mandible shape and then the shape of the mealybug. So what we're trying to do is see, do those things correlate with each other? In other words, does the shape of the mandible and the shape of a mealybug in some way relate to one another? This other one over here on the right is showing you Acropyga guyanensis and Neoshevisia cephalonotis. 
And so, um, oops, sorry, before I show you that. So that's one of the things we're looking at right now. I don't have any results to show you yet. What I can tell you is that um, there is interesting things going on between the mandibles and the mealybugs. It turns out that this analysis is, there's, uh, well, not to get too much, in, there's a number of compounding, confounding variables we have to overcome in running this analysis and we're making our way um, through doing that. But there are some really interesting patterns emerging um, with this relationship between these um, two, um, these, looking at it this way. One thing I will say is we just did this from a 2D analysis. So in other words, we took a three-dimensional object and analyzed it in a two-dimensional space you can actually also do this three-dimensionally. It's um, much more labor intensive. The informatics is much more involved and it's also much more expensive because the machine that you have to do it on is very different. Um, but the next level to take this is probably to look at a three-dimensional um, analysis of this. And we actually have a, a colleague who is a um, faculty at UMBC um, who's really into Mandib mandibles in general, who may be um, taking a look at some of this. He actually was scheduled to work on this right before the, um, to go on the machine in Hopkins to look at this and then the pandemic came. So we are a little delayed in that, but we'll get there. So our big question is this Acropyga and mealybug co-diversification. So in other words, did we get these, if we look at the trees, the evolutionary trees of the mealybugs and the ants, do they form a pattern with each other or not? Um, now, I'll spare you all the expense. I don't know the exact answer to this just yet. This is actually one of the things that we're working on. We're really close. I'm super excited. I've been working on this group since 1998. And we're actually, the phylogenies are um, being generated as we speak by our postdoc, who's actually down at the Smithsonian. Um, we should have had the trees by now, but obviously the last year, everything's been delayed. But we're getting, I can, I keep emailing them every day saying, Dietrich, do you got the results yet? Because I really want to see. Um, what we got, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease you with a little bit of data that we have. Um, I'm not gonna get into all this because obviously this is really interesting to me, not as interesting to non acrobia people, um, but this is, these are what evolutionary trees look like, right? And there's lots of stuff that goes into building these and I'd be happy to talk to someone about this more if anyone's interested in the specifics, but let's sort of um, um, suffice it to say, what we do is we collect DNA from the ants and the mealybugs and um, we look at, Nowadays, what's really cool is we can look at genomics level data. And what that means is the way that we gather the data is different than when I first started in grad school, but it also means we get way more data than we used to get. So um, just to put it in context, when I was in grad school, my work involved, you know, did a PhD for six years and I looked at three genes and that comprised about 1800 base pairs. So 1800 of those little letters, right? that make up, and that was from three different genes. Well, with our genomics data set that we have now, we're using a thing called ultra conserved elements, which is a type of genomics level data. And we're generating over 2 million base pairs worth of data. So um, all that stuff I did 20 years ago was probably, you know, it's, I always tell students that, you know, everything you do now, 20 years from now, you're gonna be like, wow, that was a lot of work. And now we can do a million times amount of the data for a lot less effort. Um, but anyway, we build these trees using that data. And what we do with these evolutionary trees is we look at hypotheses, like are, is there co-diversification between the ants and the mealybugs happening? And this is what we're working on right now. Um, in this data set, one of the things I just wanna sort of point out is that one of the really interesting things that we, some of the things we can do with this data is look at what patterns do we see? And so one of the patterns we see in Acropyga right away is that there's this really deep um, split that occurs within the genus. So this genus is pantropical, so it's found throughout the world along the equator. But one of the things we see is that Acropyga very early in its evolutionary history separated into two big clades. One found in the Americas in the New World, primarily centered on the Neotropics, um, and the other um, a, a paleotropic or old world clade of um, Acropyga that we see here. That's a really deep split and I'll sort of show you. So what I mean by that is that split happened early in the evolution of Acropyga and it's sort of been maintained. Um, in other words, you know, the Americas haven't been invaded more than once or vice versa um, by these different groups. And one of the other things we can do with these um, evolutionary trees is we can actually do things where we can do what are called dating analysis. So we can ask the question, if we look at that evolutionary tree can we build hypotheses about where the genus evolved, right? So we can, we can ask the question, did it evolve in the neotropics or in the Asian tropics or the Afrotropics? This tree is actually equivocal um, because of the way the, um, 
the branches fall. We're actually getting, I, I feel almost pretty confident to say Acropyga evolved in the Afrotropics and there's some good reasons for that, but this tree is not showing that. But the other thing we can look at is dates. We can do a dating analysis and we can ask the question, when did these splits happen? These branches, this branching pattern that um, we see here. Um, and these are some dates just to sort of throw out. So what this tree is showing us is that the genus Acropyga is probably around 30, 35 million years old. So in other words, the genus probably evolved around 30, 35 million years ago. And that that separating into the new world, which is all these little blue dots up here, and old world, which is these little purple, um, red, and uh, green dots down here, happened really quickly within the evolution of this genus. So within a few million years, they separated into um, these different groups. This date of 30 million years is really interesting to me because I'll tell you, I always suspected that Acropyga was much, much older. And the reason I thought that is because they're pan-tropical. So they're found everywhere in the tropics. And Acropyga to me don't seem like good dispersers. And the reason I'm saying that is because you have this little queen, they have these thin cuticles, they dry out really easily. Their mealybugs have thin cuticles, they out dry out really easily. It doesn't seem like something that disperses very far. So what it made me think is that, well, these guys must have evolved, you know, when you know Africa and South America were closer together more like 60, 70 million years ago. And um, we have this pantropical distribution because because of that, but that doesn't seem to be true. And in fact, there are lots of data sets that keep showing a younger age Acropyga than I would have thought. Um, but you know, that's what research is. And, and that seems to be, we, we seem to be coming um, um, pretty close to that. Uh, one of the things that's really interesting, and I'll sort of finish up by talking about this. So, so this is all this sort of fun stuff we can do. So one of the things we're doing right now with the mealybugs is we're doing a similar dating analysis. And what I can tell you is that the mealybugs, the xenococcid mealybugs, actually group into a new world and old world clade, just like the Acropyga here. And once you know it, their dates are about exactly the same. What that's implying is that there has been this co-diversification going on between these groups. In other words, at least in, in, in long term, right, in long evolutionary time, um, there's been this, this co-diversification going on. That's really, um, really interesting stuff. And we're gonna get more into the weeds to sort of look at how specific that co-diversification um, is that's going on. Uh, one of the things I just wanna point out, the reason why I think Acropyga is very likely probably Afrotropical is because the closest related group of Acropyga is this group of tiny, tiny little ants, even tinier than Acropyga, which are pretty small, um, called Agrulomermix. They're exclusively, Af Af exclusively Afrotropical. In fact, the reason I was in South Africa last um, year was partly to collect these um, critters. So they, and um, they occur primarily in um, Southern and Eastern Africa. This, this map here that we, I should actually color in um, Tanzania here too, and Zambia. They've been collected in those places as well. Um, um, but this is this um, interesting group. And I just sort of mentioned this because um, what's wild about this is that these ants are very different than Acropyga in the sense that they do occur on the surface. They run around the surface. And unlike Acropyga, which, which prefers wet rainforest habitat, these ants like dry woodland habitat. So savanna, Miambo woodland, those kind of places that you find in Southern and Eastern Africa. What's really good about knowing what the closest relative to the Acropyga are is what we can do. And one of the things we've been doing is look at these ants and see um, what features of Acropyga look like their adaptations for living with mealybugs and which ones did they already have that may not have anything to do with living with mealybugs. And that's what these, by comparing to its closest relative, may be doing for us. What's really interesting to me is I do know from our preliminary molecular data that I just got a few weeks ago, is there seems to be another new genus of ants that's actually between Agrulomermix and Acropyga. It's from so South Africa. I actually couldn't tell which it was, um, if it was Acropyga or Agrulomermix, which is problematic because I'm supposed to be the world's expert on this, but it actually morphologically looked like both of them. And once you know what the molecular data seems to be putting a smack dab in the middle. And so you can be sure as soon as we can travel again, we're going to go back to, it's from um, the Cape region of South Africa. We'll head back and try to see, does this thing tend mealybugs? And if it does, which mealybugs does it tend? Because it looks like it's kind of an intermediate between these, uh, between these two groups, it's kind of a fun thing. Uh, anyway, this Agrilomermix, we were talking, um, Bronwyn was mentioning um, new species and things like that. This is a genus that, these are tiny ants, really, really small, um, but there's lots of new species. We probably have 
12 or more new species um, from across um, Southern Africa to describe. And that's sort of one of the themes that I sort of work on, right? I, I, I do a lot of taxonomy and um, new species descriptions. And, you know, one of the things I always like to emphasize, and I'll just sort of uh, finish up with this, is that, you know, we live on a largely unexplored planet, right? I mean, um, you know, we're looking for life on other planets and things like that, which is great, I suppose. But, you know, the, much of diversity of life here on Earth, we know very little about. And even in a well-known, relatively well-known insect group like ants, that remains true. Um, there are about 14,000 described ants. It's probably about twice that number undescribed. Um, and so I see that even in these, you know, in these groups, these, these, these probably all look the same to you. They almost all look the same to me. So, um, but there are lots of, lots of new ones to find out there. Okay, so I will finish with that. And I would be happy to um, take any questions that folks might have. Oh, I think you're muted, Bronwyn. Thank you so much, John. That was great. Um, I, if Rachel, let's see. Is it Gabea? Has it her name? Uh, it's actually Gabe. Gabe, sorry. That's all right. Um, I was just wondering, so you have all these subpopulations of mealybugs. Do you ever observe any type of mating behavior between a, individuals in a, in a hive? You mean between the mealybugs? Yeah. Yeah, so one of the interesting things, and there's another question that relates to this um, um, by Kyle with this idea of how picky um, they are. Um, I guess you're talking about this in terms of plants. I'll get to that too. Um, so yeah, what's happening with the mealybugs? We don't entirely know. And in fact, one of the things that we were gonna do last summer, I have a grad student, we were all scheduled, had everything ready, permits ready to go and everything to go to Panama for a month. And we were gonna to go to the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute down there and spend a month. And we were gonna look at a, intensely study a local population. So there are about six species of Acropyga that we know occur in this place. And um, we were gonna really look at this question of what's happening inside an individual nest. Um, how picky are the ants? Do the ants, how faithful are the ants to one mealybug? How faithful are the mealybugs to one ant? Um, it seems like they're very species specific, but there's probably some cheating that goes on. We know that they're not always completely faithful to each other um, in terms of, and what I mean by faithful, what I'm talking about that is that if there's one species of mealybug and one species of ant, do they only ever use each other or do they also sometimes get used by other species of either mealybugs or ants. Um, so we really want to look at that. So one of the things we, were, we had set up is to do experiments where we take mealybugs from one nest, say of the same species of Acropyga and try to see, will, will another nest of Acropyga take those mealybugs? What happens if we switch the, switch the species of mealybugs? Will they still take the mealybugs? So we really don't know any of those questions, but. Um, and then one of the things that we're really beginning to focus on is the idea of the population genetics, which would get at this question of reproduction, because it's a really interesting question if, okay, so if the mealybug, if the queen is carrying a mealybug, and that's the sole individual that's being used, it implies they should be really inbred, right? And we should be able to pick that up genetically if that's happening. I don't know what the answer to that is yet. Um, you know, my, my colleague likes, likes to talk of this, we like to talk about this as potentially being a type of domestication, if you will, in that you have the ants controlling vertical transmission. And if the, if the mealybugs really are heavily inbred, it's actually not so different than what humans have done with populations where we take something that we like, we keep like mating with like, and we get the form that we want, right? And it, it, the, the question is something similar going on with the ants. In the fungus guarding grow, growing ants, it does, right? We know that the ants have manipulated the fungus um, in various ways and vice versa, right? Who is manipulating who? You could ask the same question about us with the things we live with too. Um, but um, so yeah, it's a really good question. Like, do they ever mate? Does outbreeding ever occur? Um, we don't know. What we do know is that the mealybugs themselves, um, the queens, when they pick a mealybug, seem to always pick a gravid female, so a pregnant female. Um, what's interesting about these mealybugs is they have, they, they don't produce many eggs at one time. They, instead, they produce really big eggs and usually just one or two eggs at a time, um, which is really interesting. And, and it's also one of the things um, 
we kind of expect if there's a lot of um, uh, manipulation going on by the ants. Um, and, and we kind of see that happening. In this. So yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. We don't know um, what's exactly what's happening, but I, I want to get at that. And so again, once we can get down and start getting the population level genetics, we'll hopefully start to have a better idea of how inbred or not these things are. If they're not inbred, that actually tells us, if we see lots of, if, if, if the populations are deviated from what we would expect with inbreeding, because we can calculate that, right? If it's different, then it means, yeah, they're, they're going around and mating with other mealybugs outside their nest, which would be really cool if that turns out to be true. Because then it gets into a question of how, like what, how, that, how that's happening. Do you want to tackle Kyle's question? Oh yeah, so this was talking about the, um, yeah, the pickiness of the, this is a really uh, interesting question. So how picky they are on, on with plants? We don't know, um, but they're probably not that picky. And the reason I'll, I say that is because the easiest place to find, so if I travel down to, uh, I was just down in Peru in 2019 collecting, and the best place to, the easiest place to find Acropyga are on um, some of the big cash crops. So cacao, if you go down to chocolate trees, you always dig up a chocolate you know, around cacao, you're gonna find Acropyga coffee which of course is not native to the new world, but there's always Acropyga on it. Banana, which is also not native to the new world. Um, so I don't think they're that particular, that picky. It's a little bit hard to tell though, to be honest, um, what plants the roots they're on, um, because you know when you dig in the soil, these are tiny, right? The mealybugs are about a half a millimeter in size. And so you, they're on very thin roots. And so sometimes tracing that back to a plant is not, um, an identifiable plant is not easy, um, particularly in rainforest environments where the soil is chock full of roots like crazy anyway. Um, but yeah, that's an interesting, um, it's an interesting question. My guess is again, that I don't think that the, they're probably not that specific, um, just based on the fact that we find them on all these, you know, a plantation is a great place to find Acropyga, a shaded plantation. They don't, they're not gonna be in a coffee plantation or. Um, cacao plantation that's open. It's if it has um, canopy on top, it, they'll find them there. Um, Sue wants to know how is it determined that um, Acrylomyrmex is related to Agrophyga? Oh well, so that's based on this. If if we go back to the um, phylogeny that we looked at, um, that that evolutionary tree, we look at whoever is the closest relative, and that that closest relative with with really good support now is that group of Gorilla Myrmex. Um, and um, so it also is supported morphologically. It actually makes a lot of sense. That actually is the group that we had long suspected was the closest relative to Acrophyga. It's just now getting um, the morpho the molecular data has really helped us help confirm that, um, that, that's, that that's true. So that's what we sort of look for um, in there um, uh, in looking at that. I had a Jurassic Park question. Sure. So are, were you able to, I mean, with the, if you see something in an insect in amber, are you able to extract the DNA from those and, 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 and measure them against uh, what you're seeing today? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So one of the really cool things about the type of genomics data we use, um, this ultra conserved elements or UCEs, um, is that, it's lots of data, but it's actually from little tiny snippets. So uh, an individual um, target that we use might only be a few hundred base, well, it might actually be, be down to just a few dozen base pairs long, and it might just be a few up to a few hundred base pair longs. The, the reason that's important, so bear with me, for thinking about Jurassic Park is that one of the things that happens with DNA over time is it's not that DNA disappears from like museum specimens, for example but the DNA gets chopped up, right? So it's still there, but it gets chopped up um, um, over time. With the traditional type of sequencing, like if you were to pick a gene, like a gene from the mitochondrion, you have to find the primers and it needs to hook on one end and hook on the other end and they have to meet. And if the DNA is broken up, the primers can't function properly and it, and it tends to fail. So older specimens were really hard to do using that method. The really nice thing, UCE data, it doesn't matter because you're already taking these little snippets that are already there. So what that means is we can get data from really old specimens. So for instance, not amber yet, so bear with me, but like we've gotten specimens from um, uh, data from 
specimens at the Smithsonian that are 100, 120 years old. No problem. That was unheard of. When I started doing this stuff in like 1998, you didn't look at specimens to try to get DNA from 100 years old because it was going to be a monumental amount of work and you probably weren't going to get very much out of it anyway. This has changed, right? So now every specimen that exists is actually um, usable at a molecular level, which is a totally new, you know, in the last decade, that's a revolution in the way of, in the study of biodiversity. Um, and we actually see the results of a lot of that, right? All this stuff happening with mammals, all these new mammals being found is actually happening with a lot of collections where people can take pieces of hair from 150 year old specimens and actually get sequence out of it. So, okay, so back to your question, Jurassic Park question. So, so theoretically, yes, within amber, there would be DNA. The DNA is probably there. It may not be, it depends on how the amberfication happened. Um, probably there. And theoretically, genomics level data could get it. There are, I mean, you could get it with genomics level data. Um, so people have tried, they've gotten little pieces, but not very much yet. And it's, it's super duper labor intensive and um, technically extremely challenging because there's all sorts of contamination issues that you have to worry about. Um, and the DNA is obviously highly degraded, right? When you're talking about something, I mean, Jurassic, geez, that would be really, really ancient. Um, and so, um, so my understanding, and I, and I might be wrong about this, I, ha I haven't kept up with this much, but we're not really quite there yet. Will we get there? Maybe. Um, it's certainly, certainly from Dominican amber, um, it seems very reasonable that you could do it. it. To my knowledge, there are people have attempted, and there actually was a science paper published back in the um, early 90s saying they actually got DNA from, um, what was it? There was something where they, anyway, it turned out that it actually was a human DNA. They, they, it was contamination. It actually got in science, it was a big deal. And then people looked at the data somewhere and said, wait a second, that's not, that's not what you think it is. Um, so yeah, people are working on that. There's a lab, actually, there's an ancient DNA lab at Smithsonian who they, they that one of the things they do is they focus on looking at that. Um, I think we'll get better at it. I, I think some of those DNA fossils will become more accessible um, to us. We'll okay. check back with you in 20 years. Yeah, we'll see in 20 years. Well, geez, you know, one of the wild things, can I just tell all of you, it's really wild now. I, I was actually, um, some of my colleagues at um, Smithsonian were showing me there are these new devices now and they're like this big, they're like the size of your phone. And actually what you can do, it's like a tricorder from like Star Trek because what you can do is you can actually take a specimen and stick it in this thing and it actually will sequence, will produce genomics level data. It will uplink it to the internet and you can actually, so you can be in the Amazon. They did this, actually, they trial run it, ran this with some birds. Um, um, sequence the darn birds in the middle. They were just in the field collecting the data, actually, as they were out there. So my guess is, yeah, it's going to be very different in 20 years how we collect data. You know, Now there might not be any Amazon left to sample the insects from, but we'll have the technology to do it. That's well, a different it's idea. another reason why natural history collections are so important and we have to absolutely you know, look back in history and all the people who've been collecting and continue to collect because nature and uh, it continues to change. So um, and we can, you know, become one of our community curators and help us take care of those. Well, and what's, what's really cool about the collections too, and, and I think this is a really important point about collections in general is that, you know, the um, evolving uses for them. So, you know, when people collected these specimens 100 years ago, nobody was thinking it would be able to get, they didn't even know about DNA, right? So they, they, weren't, they didn't think that these would be used for DNA analysis, but now we can. So we can, so one of the neat things about collections, right, is they're, even though it's a 100 year old, 200 year old specimen, whatever it is, their use actually has evolved, right? I'd like to use this, like plants as another example, right? When, when people were collecting, plants hundred years ago, they didn't think people would be counting stomata to look for evidence of climate change, but now people are using it for that. And so collections, even dead things are actually pretty dynamic. I think that's a really good, a good point. <clears throat> um, Santa Frith wants to know um, that your, your research is new. And I think that that's part of it. It's exciting that we get to hear from you about research and process and all of the, the, the questions that you're asking and how you're answering them, which is fascinating. Um, is there a book or paper that could give him some background on the topic? Well, I mean, certainly there's lots of scientific, like 
you know, technical papers, the things that I've published and other colleagues have published that I'd be happy to share with, um, I could send you um, some of that. You could disperse it to folks if they'd be interested. But um, I'm trying to think if there's good, um, even like more general um, text. There are a number of good books on general um, books on ants that have like mutualistic relationships in it. Um, I have to, I'm drawing a blank right now on some of those titles right off the top of my head, but there are some things like that that are also, not to say into Acropyga itself, but it may mention, they'll mention them um, that have that have things. Um, so yeah, there, there are some things out there. I mean, obviously there's the technical papers too, but those, you know, for people interested, I'd be happy to send the references, but some of that's maybe a little bit too much inside well, baseball. I, I, I will, I'll, I'll, I'll email offline um, Stanford and see what he, he wants and then we can okay. get the information that, uh, that his brain needs. Sure, absolutely. Anybody else have any questions for Dr. LaForma right now? Ants, really bugs? I have a question. Yeah. Go ahead. Fred. Hi, John. This hey, is Fred. Fred. How are, How are you? I'm good, man. Hanging in there. Teaching <laughs> from home. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. Yeah, right. <laughs> Especially lab, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so um, the analyses of the, the sequencing and all that, do you do that at Towson? Or so, is that sent out somewhere? Well, so so the genome, the, 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 the sequencing is all actually um, offshored. And in fact, um, yeah. everybody kind of offshores it now because um, Right. It's just so much cheaper. You know, I, I remember when I was a grad student, we used to, you know, I had to like pour my own sequencing gels and it, there would always be like a disaster. And it was like so disappointing. You'd spend like a whole month doing something and then like your gel would have urea in the wells or something and it didn't work. And it was just like a huge disappointment. So like, yeah, most of the sequencing stuff is sent off partly because the machines that do it are super expensive. Um, yeah. So it's just cheaper to send them to a facility. So like Smithsonian, so I, we have a postdoc at this who's, located at the Smithsonian. And so he takes the data to a certain point and then he ships the um, ships that off to, I don't, I don't remember what company we're sending it to now, but yeah. Well, I know there's a lot of um, repositories for this sort of thing. And in fact, databases you can get on the internet and log into these places and um, they store genomic sequences for tens of thousands of organisms yeah. insects in particular is real big so I, I just wondered in your case you know since this is your line of work if maybe the the wonderful biological sciences department had that uh, kind of equipment on hand for you <laughs> well, well we do actually we do have a next gen sequencer which is what you would use to do this right and, okay. um, and they use it um various folks use it but um in my experience so the next gen sequence is great if, if you want to just give students experience doing it. But if you actually want to get lots of data, it's probably not the best use of funds, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. Just because it, there's going to be, a, it's it's just easier to ship it off to, you know, because the technicians, they're doing it every day. That's what they do. And they're just so much better at it. I, I remember as a grad student, always feeling like this too, you know, I would sequence stuff and it'd be every like few months I would do it. I just was never very good at it because I just didn't do it every day. And so it's, it, it, you know, it, it's now the cost is such that it's, it's, it's cheaper actually to ship it off than actually have people do it. Yep. We still do some of it. Like I'll have students do some of it if, again, just for the experience of, of, of them doing it. But um, the data is usually much cleaner when you ship it off and get it back. <laughs> right, right. That makes perfect sense. Um, early in the discussion, this is going away from your Acropyja ants, but um, we talked about myrmecophilic ants. Uh -huh. the, one, the ones, you know, with the relationships with the uh, Lepidoptera larvae in particular. And you mentioned in Australia that there were some that do that. There's actually some who have um, the relationship with the green tree ants of all things who are voracious ants. Yes. And it's the, the biggest Lycaenid in the world has a relationship with the green tree ants, right? It's a two inch long, two inch wide wingspan. It's a big, for a Lycaenid, it's huge. But right here in Maryland, we have Edward's hair streak, uh, which we used to find uh, reg regularly at Soldier's Delight. Um, it's disappeared from there now. Gambrel State Park and a few other locations where there's uh, 
barons and things like that and scrubland, you could still maybe find these hair streaks. They have an association with the mound builder ants. Oh, right. Yeah. With, which is with, really interesting. It, yeah, that's with the Allegheny mound building ant. The, right. From like yeah. the Exectoides. Yeah. Very cool. And, and then uh, in Europe, there's a bunch of uh, the blues, the blue lysinids that have ant relationships too. Yeah, and thanks for mentioning that. Fred, I actually forgot about that example right here in Maryland. That's a, that's a really good one. Um, right. Yeah, mound building ants are really crazy. I mean, they're they're just spectacular. They really are. We have them in uh, in Greece. I've seen them there, uh -huh. and the mounds are enormous. You wouldn't believe how big they could be. Almost as like the half the size of a car. You know, in size. I've seen them that big. Um, just phenomenal. But um, they have also other types uh, besides the mound builders. The blues that are on the uh, rocky slopes, and there's ant nests in there that they live down in, and things like that. So there's there's quite a few examples of this sort of thing, which is again going back to the mutualistic relationships you were talking about. Uh, they ants actually feed their larvae to the caterpillar. Yeah, and what's really uh, this raises a really good point too, and I always this is a perfect group to sort of bring this up with, right? Is that I always try to emphasize this with students, why insects are so great to study in general, right? Even those kinds of discoveries can be made right here in our own backyard, right? You don't, you don't have to travel to make really wild discoveries in, with insects because there's so much we don't know, even for species that are pretty common. That's um, right. So I think that that's a really good point for that. And even here now in the winter time, they're still around somewhere in some shape or form. You can't see them though. <laughs> <laughs> And scientific discovery is not limited to uh, quote unquote professional scientists. Many, many, Absolutely. many discoveries have been made just by being out and curious and doing the looking. Um, any other questions for Dr. Lapola this evening? I have it's another very brief one. Yeah, Gabe, uh, go ahead. You have, do you teach any courses just out of curiosity or you, are you primarily research at Towson? No, I, 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 I primarily teach actually. So yeah, I teach um, entomology and vertebrate zoology um, okay. sort of relate to this kind of stuff. And then I, I teach instruction to ecology and evolution, which is sort of my bread and butter class, I guess. So lots and lots of students. So lots of pre-med students who don't want to teach ecology and evolution, but hopefully I convince some of them that it's it's worthwhile by the end. <laughs> I'm a teacher also, that's why I ask, but. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, here at Towson, right, all of us are, um, you know, what is it? I don't know, I guess they tell me 60% of my time is supposed to be teaching. I guess that's, I guess, I guess that's what I'm contracted to do. Um, and we hope to, if you will, would, would like to come back and share more knowledge with us, because I think that we've just scratched the surface. Um, with ants, and maybe if, if you know, we can get back together, I'd love, we'd love to organize an ant collecting uh, a field trip. Absolutely. That's the way to do it. Get outside and see these things, and you know, these Zoom things are fine and all, but right, we need to be outside actually getting dirty and seeing stuff. That's where the, the action is. <laughs> well, thank you again, um, John. This has been fascinating. Uh, I want to get on my hands and knees and go look for some ants. Um, and, and, uh, I hope that everybody else has enjoyed it. You sure look smarter than you did when we started. Uh, and, uh, now you can take that knowledge and share it with other people and make them even smarter because that's what the world needs. Um, stay curious, everybody. I hope to see you at another upcoming talk. Um, consider joining the society if you haven't already and become one of our community curators. Uh, thank you, everybody. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Great talk, John. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thanks a lot, John.